Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the uh, webinar uh, in the IRO Forum context from CERN for upgrading the largest scientific instrument, the LHC Restart. The uh, webinar will be presented by Gimone, uh, Simone Giladoni, sorry, who uh, works in the LHC and will say a few words about himself uh, in the course of the presentation. We are going to have about 45 minutes for the uh, presentation and time for questions afterwards. If you have questions in the meantime, please put them into the chat and afterwards I'll invite you also to uh, raise your hand and uh, you can maybe ask your questions uh, via voice. We'll try to make that happen. But uh, now the floor is uh, to Simone to present the webinar. Okay. Can you hear me? Or Yeah, I think it works. Okay. So first of all, welcome at CERN. I'm Simone Gilardoni. I am by study a particle physicist and a nuclear engineer. I've done a PhD between accelerator physics and uh, um, particle physics. And I'm working since a few years uh, um, managing uh, one of the groups responsible for uh, hardware in the LHC. And uh, I'm at CERN since roughly uh, 98, uh, being a student first and then become a member of the personnel. Now, I think we can start. I, I, I'm just wondering if you can turn the camera towards the, if that's possible. I'm going to try to point a little bit to the, to the slides, uh, if, if, just to make it a little bit better. Otherwise, uh, I'm going to try to describe the slides and the things that I'm pointing to uh, while uh, while I'm presenting. Okay, so I put it on the laptop, okay? So, uh, in the next 45 minutes, I'm going to describe you a little bit what, what the LHC is, which is, by the way, the, the largest scientific instrument uh, ever built by mankind um, for the moment. We're going to see at the very end that actually we would like to do something uh, even bigger, uh, if, if possible. Um, so in the next 45 minutes, I'm going to talk a lot about uh, energy, beams, LHC, particles, and so on and so forth. I'm going to try to put a little bit of order in all these words to try to understand uh, where we are and, and, and what we're doing today. Okay, thanks. So the LHC was off uh, for about two, uh, two years. Uh, the initial plan which is here, unfortunately, before COVID, something that hit all of us, it was that we wanted to stop uh, sometimes in 2019 or starting 2020. We're going to see that we are starting these days, in fact. Um, why? Because we wanted to improve somehow uh, the infrastructure of the LHC and the infrastructure of the other accelerators that we have at CERN, and we are preparing uh, the machine to produce more data for new discoveries. Uh, Understanding also that the, our machines in general, they need uh, maintenance and improvements regularly. And that's why typically we stop for one of uh, two years. The next time is gonna be in LS3, which is now has been shifted by one year, uh, during which we do a little bit what I'm gonna describe uh, later on today. So first of all, let's see what we're doing today uh, in the accelerators. Uh, it's important because you know, there is a certain risk uh, um, or the plan is that tomorrow we would like to put beam back in the LHC after such a long time. And I'd like you to understand a little bit how to check yourself uh, from home, from your classrooms, uh, how to do that. Okay. So typically you, you, can, you can go through this link and this link will send you uh, on the web page, which is public, uh, which is this one. Okay. So I'm going to spend a few minutes to understand the content of, of this web page and just for you to, to be able to interpret uh, when Beam is going to be in the machine. So this web page contains, first of all, uh, uh, in the upper part, uh, time and date. So you see it's basically now. The energy at which the machine has been set or the, the Beam is circulating the machine. 
450 gigaton volt is the minimum energy of the LHC. How many times we put beam in the LHC uh, since day one? Uh, what we are doing, and here it says setup. So we are preparing the machine. And actually, what we are doing is returning a final machine checkout. So we are controlling the status of the machine uh, with first beam injection tomorrow morning. So if, if everything is going to be according to plan, what you're going to see in this part of the screen uh, is actually uh, the status of the beams. We're going to see the same screen filled with more information uh, later on in, in, in this lecture. Now, if you go on the upper uh, left part of the screen, in fact, you can check the status of all the accelerators we have at CERN. Uh, all that are producing the beams, which is used either by the LHC or by the other physics program uh, of CERN. And we can check, for example, the, the, uh, what is the temperature of, of the LHC uh, now, LHC cryogenics. Uh, you probably heard already that the LHC is the coldest place uh, you can find. And you see the temperature uh, towards the hours in all the parts of the machines, which is here, uh, those are the different sectors of, of, of the LHC, is between 2 and 1.9 Kelvin, which is basically the operating temperature of, of the LHC. We're going to see later on why we need those two Kelvin and where the machine has a two Kelvin. Uh, and you see, so this, this means good conditions. So somehow we're ready. So let's go back to the, to the lecture now, if I manage. Uh, now let's close. Uh, here we are. Back to the lecture. So the LHC, what is the LHC? Uh, as we said already a few times, it's the, the largest scientific instrument ever built by mankind uh, for the moment. Uh, the circumference, so the, the dimension of the rig itself is 27 kilometers. It operates at 1.9 Kelvin, which is minus 271 something degrees. Uh, the machine itself is composed by uh, something like 10,000 plus uh, elements which are called magnets and those magnets they are used to guide uh, the beam the proton beam all around the machine uh, and actually to make them uh, changing uh, their energy thanks to electric field this time and to guide them uh, all around all around the ring we are using protons but we are doing collision also with the with the lead ions but i'm going to concentrate on protons today uh, the maximum energy of the machine reached so far for one beam is between 6.5 and 6.8 TV. We're going to try to run a 6.8 tera electron volts today. Uh, one tera is 10 to the 12 electron volt, roughly 10 to the 12 uh, batteries uh, that you find in one of the toys or, or something like this. Whereas the, in collision, since we are colliding beams uh, over beams, the total energy which is available uh, to discover new physics is, is twice this one because the beams are two. We are circulating something like 10 to the 14 uh, protons in the machine per beam. We're going to see later on what 10 to the 14 means. And one turn is, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, we have uh, about 11,000 turns per second, and we do about 1 billion uh, of collisions uh, per second. Okay. So what the LHC stands for? LHC stands, first of all, for large, uh, 27 kilometers. The reason uh, is, is because, uh, because it's, it's written basically in this form. I'm not going to use many formulas today, uh, promised. Uh, and the only thing I'm going to use these formulas to understand a little bit the concept. So the idea is that we have to keep uh, the protons circulating all around the ring, which means that we have to generate a force. So this is something that has to do uh, with the force to keep the protons actually spinning around my machine. And this force is inversely proportional to the, to the uh, radius of curvature, which means that the bigger the machine, uh, the smaller is the force we have, to, we have to use to keep my particle on track. Okay? So since we want to have very large energies, because we want to discover new particles, those are the masses of the, of the particles that uh, we know today in mega electron volts. Uh, the idea is that actually, to keep the force uh, not too large, we have to build a large machine. Uh, and the radius of this machine is basically uh, limited by the dimension of the Earth, even though we're thinking, say, people thought about this not as a limit in the past. Uh, 
So it's given by the rest of the machine. And depending on the energy uh, that you want to have for the collisions, the magnetic field, uh, which is used to guide the particles around, is larger or smaller. Okay? So the energy at which we want to do the collisions is basically being given by the physics that we want to do. The Higgs mass around 126 uh, uh, giga electron volts, which means that the energy has to be at least uh, the one to produce uh, a Higgs boson. And B, the magnetic field, is basically given by technology. Now, uh, just because we, we discussed uh, 27 kilometers one turn, just to have an idea how long does it take to make a turn in the LHC, uh, one turn in the LHC is about 18 microseconds. Now, this number doesn't tell you much, probably. Just as an example, five milliseconds uh, is the time that it takes to, to a bee to, to make a flip off of his wings, which is about 56 turns in the LHC. When you blink your eyes, uh, this, is, this is already a pretty large number of microseconds, which is about 4,000 uh, turns in the LHC. So every time you do this, it's 4,000 turns uh, in the LHC. Just to give you a number. Now, L, we say large. Uh, Adron uh, is the H. Because in the LHC, we do collisions between uh, proton beams, protons on protons, uh, or uh, lead ions with the lead ions. Okay? And the proton is an adron, okay? because it's made of, up of quarks. So if, when we look inside the, the protons in the collision, what we find is a very rich structure made of uh, uh, subparticles, the quarks, and the glue between the quarks, which are called gluons. Okay? Now, uh, the number of protons that there are in the machines is something we can control. Okay? This is one of the technological parameters that we can enhance or reduce depending on what we want to do. We're going to see that we want to maximize it uh, to the largest number possible because this is give, giving us the, um, say, the reach, the physics reach of the machine. Now, what is a collider? Uh, because large, adron, and C stands for collider. The idea is that you have two ways to produce particles you want to study. The first one is basically you take a large accelerator, you extract the beam from the, from the accelerator, you smash it on some material, like in this case, to produce new particles. This is one way of doing uh, experiments, and this is uh, before the, the, the time of the colliders, we were doing this. But the energy that is available to discover new physics is smaller uh, compared to the case where you have two beams which are circulating uh, in opposite directions, like in the LHC. And then in some points around the LHC, they, they are put together and they collide, like in a car crash. Uh, in this case, by colliding like in a car crash, the energy which is available for new physics is larger than in this case. It's basically two times the energy of, of the beam. So when I, I was talking before about the 6.8 tele electron volts in the LHC, this is the energy of one beam which is circulating in one beam pipe separated by the other one. And then when, the, when he, he, the two beams they encounter, the total energy which is available is, is twice as much. So what, how the LHC works, we put a lot of particles going around the LHC. And then at the interaction point where the big experiments are sitting, we have one beam coming in one direction, the other beam coming in the other direction. Before they separate in two separated tubes, they're put together in a single tube, and then they do collision, and then basically those are the products of the collisions. Okay? We can do this in four uh, sections of the LHC, that you see uh, in, the, in the right part of this presentation, of these slides, uh, where we have the four experiments, CMS, ALICE, ATLAS, and LHCB. So you see all around the machine, the two beams, they circulated separated, they're physically in two separated tubes, and then when we come close to the interaction points, the beams are driven by, by magnets inside the single tube where the uh, collision occurs. The other point is that, as we're going to see, when the collision occurs at the interaction point, we want to, be, to have the, the beam the as possible, few micrometers times few micrometers, to enhance the probability to get collision and to produce something new. Why I'm telling this? Because that's the core or a largest, the largest fraction of the intervention we are doing nowadays in the LHC, how to make this uh, beam the smallest possible. At the, at the collision point, but 
we're going to produce a lot of a lot of particles and somehow before uh, starting to introduce all the modification to the LHC, the experiment they have to cope with few events per crossing, in fact, is more than five. Huh? It's more 60 events per crossing, which means that every time the two proton groups of particles, which are called bunches, they collide, they produce about 60 new events. Uh, whereas in the future, the experiments, they have to deal with a lot of particles produced uh, in the collisions. And that's the reason why the experiments already today, the four big ones, went through a big first step of upgrade to be able actually to cope with the modification that we introduced in the LHC and the, the accelerators before the LHC that are creating more and more collisions in such a way that in, in this more and more collision, they are enhance their capability to detect new particles. Um, now, there are also other experiments that you heard probably less than those four, uh, they're smaller, but they are, they are also looking for uh, physics beyond the physics that we know today, uh, not necessarily using collisions like those four, but looking to the product of this collision far away from, from the beam pipe of the LHC. So why, the, why, why running the LHC is, com is so complicated? Why this is a so complicated machine? Basically, just to give you a picture, you have to think that we have roughly 2,000 group of particles circulating in the LHC, close to the speed of light. Uh, with an energy sufficient in total to melt 2.5 tons of copper because at 6.8 TV times the, the number of particles you have circulating in the LHC, this would be sufficient if you stand on 2.5 tons of copper, basically, to make it liquid. Uh, and there we have to control those particles to meet in few micrometers in a, on a surface of few micrometers and few micrometers in the center of our detectors, about uh, 11,000 times per second, okay? It's not easy, and you can imagine that controlling this is not so simple. And the idea is that everything is also, uh, is also under meters underground. Because the entire machine uh, obviously is not on surface, but is located uh, uh, underground. And we are not sufficiently happy about this because to discover new particles and new physics beyond the standard model, beyond the Higgs boson, actually what we want to do, and that's one of the reasons why we had to stop for two years, is exactly to increase even further uh, the number of particles that we are able to circulate in the machine and to make this beam even smaller than what they are today, uh, actually to increase the probability of producing physics, okay? So one of the reasons why we stopped uh, for such a long time is because we wanted to improve the LHC and the machines that are used to fill the LHC with protons in such a way that we can reduce even further the dimension of these beams to enhance uh, even more the probability to produce new particles. Now, the idea now that I'm, I'm going to work through a little bit uh, the LHC, trying to understand a little bit what's for and, and ending a little bit about uh, with the future of the LHC, but also of the future of accelerators in general. So first of all, the, the LHC, you, you can walk in the LHC thanks to the uh, Google Street View. Uh, in fact, we have uh, the entire LHC, uh, which, is, uh, which has been mapped, uh, as you see there, including the, including the accelerators. Yeah, sorry, including the experiments. Now, what are the, the main goals of the LHC? Um, just to give you an idea of what we're looking for. Uh, so first of all, uh, some of those we already somehow reached. The first question is that, what is the origin of the masses of the particles? Um, then what we're looking for is something a little bit complicated that I'm gonna say uh, more uh, later on, is, uh, is supersymmetry there or not. And the idea is that supersymmetry is a theory beyond the, the theory uh, that we know all about, which is the standard model of particle physics, that should lead to what we call the uh, unification of the forces. I'm going to say a little bit more uh, later on on that. Then the problem is that this standard model on what we know about is explaining only something like between four or five percent of the, of the mass and the energy of the universe which is only a tiny fraction 
compared to what's, what's going on in the entire universe. So also this we would like to understand a little bit better. Then we know that what, what, after the beginning of the universe, the, there was a, a, a very particular state of matter, which we don't have today <laughs> on our tables or say in our everyday life, which is this quark lone plasma, which is a sort of a soup of, of uh, hadron uh, constituents. And also this we would like to understand a little bit what it is. And then one of the big questions is that, uh, why our universe is made of matter uh, and not antimatter? Okay, why a proton is a proton and not an antiproton in, in, in a nuclei uh, of hydrogen, for example. And that's something that so far it, we would like to understand but it's complicated, okay? We would like to repeat, being able to repeat, for example, uh, the uh, Newton experiment or why Newton thought about gravity uh, by producing, for example, or having the idea to see if an apple made of antimatter would fall exactly like an apple would do today. Meaning if gravity is behaving the same manner for a matter or antimatter. Now, this is one of uh, the experiment which is ongoing at CERN today. Uh, but you see, the, the gravity is, looks like something simple uh, because we all know about a, a pen falling on the floor from a table. But we don't know really well how this is really working in terms of, uh, of particle exchange, uh, like, for example, other forces like uh, the electromagnetism. And we don't understand too well also why we have only apples and not anti apples in this universe. So those are the, the kind of things we would like to understand with the, with the LFC and the future uh, accelerators. Now, the, the theory we have today, which is working beautifully, is called the standard model, the standard model of particle physics. Uh, the, the, the big formula that you see on the cup is the, is, is the formula which describes, uh, which is the standard model, which describes the different forces that acts between particles. Um, but as I said before, uh, this kind of theory describes pretty well processes like uh, the uh, uh, beta decay, which is the responsible of natural radioactivity, for example, by the uh, transformation of quarks into other type of quarks by emitting what is called a, a boson. So this is the carrier of the uh, electroweak interaction which in turn decays into, into other particles, an electron and, and, and the antineutrinos. Now, this is, a, this is the kind of processes that the standard model describes pretty well, but unfortunately, this describes only, as I said before, four or five percent of, uh, of, of our universe. So the idea of an accelerator like the LHC is to take uh, us from the, our everyday life, so, if we go in this direction in this graph, this is time. If we go in the other direction, it's energy. And the idea is that the, uh, the universe of today uh, is, is, is not too hot, it's not too energetic. And the idea is that by uh, our particle accelerator, we want to, to give particles enough energy actually to try to understand the closest possible to, the, to when the Big Bang occurs. And we do this in the meantime, by studying the different forces or the nuclear forces, the one that keeps together the, the particles with force, magnetism, electromagnetism, and so on. Now, where we are today? But we're, today we are, we are, sorry, we are a little bit stuck here in the sense that the, we are trying to understand if really those kind of forces like the electromagnetism or the force that keeps together my nuclei, uh, uh, they, they, can, they can join by a theory which is called supersymmetry. That's one of the theory that we are studying the most. Uh, and that's where we are today. And that's why somehow we would like to enhance the capability of the LHC and the experiments, actually to understand a little bit better what's happening in this region of, of this graph. And the idea, but, oops. Okay, the idea is basically we are sitting here that's our universe in time and energy. And then we would like to go back and to reproduce the, uh, the density of matter uh, at the, say, the closest possible at the beginning of the universe. So one of the questions that we are asking ourselves where is dark matter, dark energy, what is this? But do not forget that dark matter and dark energy is basically what is, is between us every day. The only point is that we don't know what it is. So to, to study of all, all of this, we're building a collider, as I said before. And what we do in a collider 
uh, we would like to study certain type of events, like the creation of, of, of an X boson. That's what we can measure with the experiments. Uh, basically, nature is telling us there is a certain probability if you collide two particles to create a certain physics process. So this is given by nature. And all what we can do is to build an accelerator. So this is what we put ourselves in a machine to create a certain number of collisions, which is given by this number, in such a way that this number times the probability of doing something is going to tell us how many events we can create for a given process. Why I'm citing this? Because the luminosity of a collider is something you can monitor from home. It's going to appear on the screen when we're going to do collisions in DHC at a certain point. And the problem is that the event we want to study, they are pretty rare. You don't have thousands of thousands of millions per second. You have only few. So when we do collisions here, we have to select one event in, you can read yourself this number. I'll give you an example. This is uh, uh, one of the plots that describes how uh, our colleagues found the X boson. So this is the energy of the mass of the particles for a specific uh, decay mode uh, uh, to find the X boson. And this is the number of events that one of our detectors found. And you see this number, the luminosity is, is down there. And you can have a look to the dates. Now, this means only noise, okay? So every dot is, is a number of particles in a certain energy interval. And if we discover a new particle, you should see a small bump in this. So you see, we were running days, days, and days DLHC, and basically you see nothing there, okay? Days, 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 and the luminosity was accumulating, days, days, days. And then at a certain point, you start to see around 126, this small peak appearing. Okay, but two years already passed. Okay, and now you see that's the peak which describes the X bosons. So that's why I'm saying one of the big goals of the LHC today is to increase our capability to produce collisions. Okay, because the event that we want to study requires years of data recording before actually we can see something. So that's why, as I say, we want to, to, uh, to enhance the luminosity of my collider. Now, I'm not going to tell you uh, how we come to this formula. I'm just trying to convince you that this, this formula makes sense. And let's this formula talking, OK? So the luminosity of my collider is something that goes with the number of particles that are able to put in my collider per group of particles. And this is important because this number goes like the square, which means that if I can put two times more particles in my collider, I'm going to have four times uh, of, uh, of collisions. So four times more statistics for my, for my discoveries. Uh, this is the, the revolution frequency. So basically, it's how fast I turn in my accelerator. This is fixed because the geometry I cannot change of, of the LHC. These are how many group of particles I can put in my accelerator. This is fixed. This I cannot really touch. Uh, this is basically telling me this F is if, if I collide uh, like two cars and horns, this is going to be close to one. So that's the way I would prefer someone to have collisions. And the luminosity is larger if those two numbers, which are the dimension of my beam in the experiments, it's small. Okay? And you see, this cost us about 10 years of development before we can increase the number of, of, bunches, uh, sorry, of particles of protons in my accelerator. And this requires between 10 and 15 years before actually I can make those numbers smaller by building new magnets, meaning developing new technology. So the same screens that I show you at the very beginning, this is the way it's going to look like, not tomorrow, because tomorrow we're not going to do collisions, uh, but very close to what is going to uh, show up tomorrow, hopefully. And it, the way it's going to be uh, when we're going to do collision in the LHC. So here you see time during the day. This is the energy of my accelerators up to at that time. So you see this was 2016 at 6.5 TV. In black is the force generated by, my, uh, by uh, my magnets, so to keep my particles around the ring. And red and blue are the intensity per beam, two beams, one circulating clockwise, the other one circulating anticlockwise, as they are in the machine. So the story of these days that, and this is the intensity, sorry, intensity 14, and this is the famous luminosity. So what this plot is telling me is that at 11 in the morning, 
the machine was at 450 GV. You remember at the beginning I said uh, this is the minimum energy. We put the beam in the machine, the two beams, then we, we extract them in the machine because we were just checking how the machine was behaving. Then we try to accelerate from 450 GV to 6.5 TV, the two beams, you see, the, uh, we put more intensity first and then we accelerated. Then we started probably to do collisions because in, the luminosity is zero if there is no collision, but it's a finite number if we start to do them. But then something, the machine said, uh, no, the, there's something that is not running as it should. So we restarted the game, we accumulated uh, particles in the machine, we started to accelerate, we started to do collision. Now, mm -hmm. you see the intensity of the two beams goes down because when you collide, you lose protons. The protons become something else, something that we want to study. So the intensity goes down. And then at the same moment, the luminosity jumps up two lines because we have collision at two experiments, in fact, at three, uh, CMS, Atlas, and, and LCB, and ELIS, four, which is not really visible here. And then again, the luminosity goes down because the intensity goes down. So that's, I must say, it, this looks like a good day in the LHC. Okay. Now, just to give you an idea of, uh, of these 10 to the 14 protons in the machine, what it means, uh, 10 to the 14 protons in the LHC, but please remember that an Avogadro number is 10 to the, 10 to the 23, okay? Uh, as an example, in 12 grams of carbon, of graphite, sorry, there are 10 to the 23 protons. So when people like me tell you, we have a lot of protons in the LHC, nothing. It's say nine order of magnitude less than what you find in 12 grams of, of graphite. And that's the maximum that you can put in the LHC. So actually this is diluted on 27 kilometers. So the LHC is always empty somehow. So now we're going to see a little bit better why we went up for two years uh, before talking about what, what's next. So the, the LHC has to stop regularly for one or two years for maintenance. And the reason is because the, the, uh, typically we don't touch only the LHC, we touch also the, all the accelerators that comes in front of the LHC to provide the beams to the LHC. So CERN, in fact, is an ensemble of very uh, large complex of accelerators. Uh, some of those serve in the LHC, some, of, uh, some others, they are producing physics by themselves uh, for other experiments. So the life of the protons uh, in the LHC that starts in what is called the Lina 4, then we go in, in the first ring, which is booster, uh, from uh, 160 MeV mega electron volts to 2 GV, 2 giga electron volts, then to the PS, the PS from 2 GV to 26 giga electron volt, then the SPS up to 450 GV, and then the LHC. Okay? And you see how we increase uh, uh, the, while we are increasing the energy of my particles, we increase also, we come closer to the speed of light. So we're not at the speed of light at all in the injectors, so in all the other rings. Uh, we come cl very close to the, to the speed of light in the LHC. Now all the others, like AD, Elena, this is for studying the property of antimatter, antiproton physics. The anti heppel that I was, I was speaking before, we, have, we produce a rare isotope that we think they were produced uh, at the very early, early stage of the universe, for example. And then we have other two locations uh, for uh, studies with fixed targets. One is here, one is there, and the other one is here to study the physics in a different way than in the collider. So by looking at it from the sky, here how it looks like the LFC, and here how it looks like the, uh, uh, the SPS. We don't see on this scale the PS, because the PS is only 600 meters circumference, the SPS is about five, six kilometers. So you can see them, see them on this scale. Now, uh, basically, the accelerators uh, before the LHC, what they do, they bring you from something which looks really like a bottle of hydrogen. Hydrogen is made by uh, a proton and an electron. So if you want to have protons, you just pull, you just take away the electrons and then you have protons. Um, up to the entrance of the LHC. Now, just to give you an idea how long does it take to, to fill the LHC, so to provide proton to the LHC, uh, in the booster, we stay something like 1.2 seconds. So we accelerate for about 1.2 seconds. In the PS, 3.6 seconds. In the SPS, roughly 20 seconds. And then in the LHC, before reaching 6.8 TV, we need half an hour. 
And then the particles, they stay there between 10 hours or so. And then, so we do collision for about 10 hours. You see the intestine going down, the magnetic field is fixed. So the energy is fixed. And then we empty the machine and we restart. Now you can compute yourself uh, how many kilometers the process they do before reaching the LHC, taking this number and the speed of light. And this is about four times the distance uh, from the Earth to the sun. So the idea is that we have to send back and forth to accelerate the particles uh, to the sun and back for at least four times before reaching the good energy uh, for the LHC. Now, the injectors in, this, in these two years uh, took a lot of uh, work because we wanted to, you remember, to improve this uh, number of uh, uh, protons in the LHC, this n square I was talking before. And to do that, we have to build a new linear accelerator. That's where the, the bottle of hydrogen uh, is sitting. And then they get accelerated up to 160 MeV. We have to increase the energy of uh, one of the two accelerators, the booster, the smaller one, uh, which is this one. And we have to adapt the PS and the SPS in such a way that they could digest uh, the increase intensity to provide it to the LHC. So and this costed time for us. And in particular, we have to build a the brand new linear accelerator, uh, because that's what is giving us the initial intensity, then, then it's gonna be used for, uh, for sun earth distances after this in the LHC. Now, and, and what we have to, to modify, basically the building block of an accelerator so is a particle source. The famous bottle of hydrogen is attached to a very complex small accelerator, which is a bigger, as big as this, to provide the initial uh, uh, beam spot size and intensity. Then we have to increase the, um, the energy of the, of the protons. This we do in the various accelerators, but then in the LHC itself by using electric fields. We have always to guide the particles to stay in the accelerator in such a way that we don't touch uh, the surfaces, uh, but also the, the, we can control what we're doing. And everything is under vacuum. We're gonna see in a moment uh, under vacuum what it means. So just to give you a, a, an insight of the LHC, so the blue are the dipoles, the one creating a vertical magnetic field, and quadrupoles, which are focusing the beam and keeping the beam confined around the machines, uh, are gray. And the idea is that, as you see, we have two apertures where the beam flows uh, clockwise and anti-clockwise, depending on where we are in the machine. And then when we come to the accelerators, the two beam pipes becomes one, and the, the particles, they are able to collide. Now, the, the, the key element uh, of the LHC are the dipoles, the blue long magnets, which are providing uh, 8.3 Tesla at 7 TV. And we have to inject to get the 8.3 Tesla to get the right force to keep the particles on track, the one I was mentioning when we were discussing large. Um, we need 11,800 amperes. Uh, we have something like exactly, not something like 1,232 dipoles all around the, the LHC. They are 15 meter long and they are superconducting. Why? Because I cannot put 11,000 ampere <clears throat> in a conductor that we have from the plug at home. It will melt, clearly. So the idea is that instead we use special materials which are called nabi titanium that are two Kelvin. They can bring a current of 11,000 uh, ampere uh, without eating. Very good, because this means that I can, I can bring all the currents I need to generate the right magnetic field. The only point is that the LHC in the two apertures, so here is where the, the beam is flowing, here is where the beam is flowing, needs to be a two Kelvin. Otherwise, this material now with titanium is an insulator. I cannot put any current in this without, without breaking it, okay? So that's why the, the LHC has to live uh, in the inner part at two Kelvin. Uh, which is basically close by where then my particles are flowing. But here in the past, they are not to Kelvin, okay? And that's one of the good feature of the, of the design of the LHC, which makes us a little bit different than the space station that we're gonna see in a moment. Now, few numbers, I, I put few numbers here because if you look to the slide, you can compute something yourself, which is pretty interesting, I would say, is uh, uh, how much is the force that pulls apart those two conductors where the two, uh, with the two beams are circulating. And you will discover that in one meter, you have the same force 
pulling apart those conductors, which is the equivalent of the thrust given by the, the space shuttle engine uh, at liftoff. But instead of having it only in, on an engine every meter, it's like the, the lift off first of, of the space shuttle. That's why it's so complicated to keep uh, the LHC uh, in good shape. Then the energy stored in the magnets, because we have 11,000 ampere and we have 1,232 uh, dipoles, it's about 10 gigajoule. You can compute how much this means. Uh, you can melt with 10 gigajoule 400 kilograms of chocolate, melt uh, 2,000, uh, 12,000 kilograms of copper, 10 seconds of a nuclear power plant. Now, the, 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 uh, the LHC is as complicated as the space station, I would say, okay? But say, there are similar conditions in the sense that the empty space where the, 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 the astronaut has to work is a little bit uh, hotter than the two Kelvin. Uh, but look how the guy has to work. Uh, whereas for us, the two Kelvin is only inside the machine. So actually, we can, we can work. Uh, if we don't have to open the machine like uh, in the lock shutdowns, so in this period of maintenance, for example, we can work, as you see, one of my colleagues on, on the external part without the need of, of putting a space, a space suit. Okay. So uh, that's the reason, basically, uh, why, why we had to stop the LHC for so long. Because being a 2 Kelvin, we have to, and we wanted to open it to work on that. Uh, going from 2 Kelvin to room temperature and back takes a lot of time. We're going to see it in, in, in a while. So until we, we, we are able to work on the external part, everything is okay. We don't need to stop too long. But at the moment where we have to put our hands inside the, really the LHC, in, inside what is called the cryostat, which is called the, the machine, then the story is completely different. So how we turn on the LHC? What we have done in the last few months? But first of all, the LHC has to work under vacuum, as I said before. And the vacuum is more or less 10 to the minus 13 tor, which is comparable to the pressure that you find on the, on the dark side on the moon. And we have to pump the equivalent, the volume, which is equivalent to a medium-sized cathedral. So this is the one uh, in, in the picture of, uh, of downtown Geneva. So first we have to make the beam pipe where the, the beam flows under vacuum. Then we have to cool the machine. From room temperature, so my 24 degrees up to two Kelvin. And this we do in step. So first we put liquid nitrogen and we have to evaporate something like 12 million of liters of liquid nitrogen to go down to, to the temperature where we can start to, to uh, put helium, we use liquid helium to, to, to go down to two Kelvin. And this is a few months of a large fraction of the, uh, of the production of liquid helium, sorry, of helium in, in Europe. And that this allows us to go to 2 Kelvin. What you don't see in the LHC tunnel uh, is that basically there is another LHC parallel to the, to the one that you see blue and gray we said before. Here is where the liquid helium is flowing. Okay? And then it's injected inside the machine. This picture has been taken during the construction. So the LHC now is sitting there. And you don't see really this part. But without this part, the LHC will not work. So how long does it take to cool the LHC from room temperature to the, uh, uh, to the, to the two Kelvin? So this picture is the same I showed you at the very beginning. Uh, it was taken two days ago. And you see, we were not, not quite at two Kelvin everywhere. We were just about to have two Kelvin. But two Kelvin is the condition to have, um, to have the machine operational. And this is how long does it take to, to put the machine at, at 2 Kelvin. Uh, so we start to room temperature. Those are the different sections of the machine. And then we go down from room temperature down to my 2 Kelvin all around the machine. Now, unfortunately, we had, we, we had to heat up again uh, the machine at a certain point. Uh, you see the temperature here is increasing because we found some faults uh, inside the, the, where, where the temperature is pretty low. And so we have to eat up again and restart some maintenance. How we find these kind of things, just a curiosity, uh, before putting the beam in the machine, we insert what is called a, the RF ping pong ball. So we have small ball like the one of you, you play ping pong, which have a, a radio frequency emitter, like a small radio, which we inject inside the, the aperture. We the, let them flowing uh, around, uh, pushed by gas, in such a way that the, uh, if they stop at a certain point, 
This means that there is an obstacle, like in this case, and then we have to reopen and remove the obstacle before actually putting any beam in the LHC. Yes. This we do actually because we don't want the beam to break anything. Okay. And then what we're doing today, I showed you before. Uh, in a normal day, what, what happens in the LHC and what you're going to see hopefully pretty soon, the, the small graph, uh, the small graph I was showing before. So this is a good day. This is time during the day. So what you see here is that we are injecting the beams. So the intensity is increasing, blue and, and red. More beam in the machine, then we accelerate. We start to do collision. So the, here is where the LHC luminosity will jump and the experiment they start to record data. And then after a few, few hours, uh, the intensity is too small to produce uh, again enough collisions. So we send the beam out from the machine and then we restart, we decelerate, so, sorry, we re reduce the magnetic field, we inject again beam and so on and so forth. So that's a good day. Fortunately, you have also bad days when the machine say, okay, something went wrong, the, the beam is extracting from the machine, you change the energy, you put beam again, then mm, something went wrong again, and so on and so forth. Okay. Luckily enough, that's most of the time. This is pretty rare. Okay, and what's next? So the idea is that we want to continue a few years like this to accumulate enough data, but then we would like to increase even more the luminosity of the LHC. Now, we talk a lot how to increase the number of protons with the injectors. Now we, have, we want to reduce the spot sites. And the idea of reducing the spot sites is basically we are studying now, now somewhere we are in 2022, to produce new magnets which are able to squeeze even more at the interaction point the spot sites uh, of, my, of my beams. And the idea is that we are going to take slowly the LHC again. We are pulling on part here in the parts of the LHC and in particular at the interaction point we are making huge works of civil engineering, so we are digging new caverns to put new infrastructure to change the magnets which are located around the experiments in such a way that we can squeeze even more my spot side. Now, a part of this work we do during the stops, like now, because if you have an earthquake in Costa Rica, the beams of the LHC does see it, okay? So when you start to dig close by the machine, we have to pay a lot of attention because if the machine is running, but it means they are going to see it. They're going to see the vibration. So, and the idea there is that the, uh, we're going to change this red part is close by the experiment. So this, the part seen by the machine, this is the part which is contained, uh, uh, which contains the experiments like La Atlas CMS. So here there would be a continuous beam pipe and the beam is coming from here. We have to dismount completely all this part and put a new one. And this is going to be done in 2026, 2029. So we are already preparing now the next step to increase the luminosity. Now, to give you something that you're gonna remember, I hope about the dimension of the beam of the LHC, if you take the coin, uh, the one euro coin, the beam has to go every time without any mistake through Spain uh, in this coin. And this is the, when the beam is large. When the beam is small, it's basically more Sardinia and course uh, on the one euro coin. So that's why the technology of the magnet that I said before is very complicated because we have to squeeze these famous high energy, high intensity beams in dimensions which are very, very tiny and keep it uh, 11,000 times per second, uh, always going in the same position without any mistake. We cannot miss pay uh, on the one euro coin. Okay, so hopefully tomorrow we're going to have beam again in the machine and the adventure is going to restart again. Now, what after the LHC? So we're thinking also about this. Now, on this plot, those are the years at which different uh, accelerators, colliders, they were produced. And the LHC is sitting up there. Okay, LHC and this is the energy. Now, we think that there must be some new physics also at energy which are not necessarily accessible to the LHC. And the idea is, again, let's build a new accelerator. But you remember at the very beginning we say large, large Y, because if I want to keep the, the accelerator on Earth with magnetic field that I can build, that the magnetic field has to be strong at the machine, actually it has to be large in any case. Uh, this is what we were saying before. Large energy means 
large magnetic field or a large, uh, large radius of curvature. So the next machine we are talking about is not small. If this is the LHC with the SPS and the PS, the next machine we are, we are thinking about is a 100 kilometers machine, okay? We're going to do this step. The Hadron Collider will come after probably a Electron-Positron Collider, a E plus E minus Collider, but the dimension we are thinking about is, is like this because of the reason I was saying before. The higher the energy, the bigger is the machine, basically. And this is just to give you a feeling of uh, how the, uh, the LHC would look like with respect to a part of this uh, uh, incredible accelerator. Everything, again, is going to be underground. This is the Geneva region, the LHC, the lake, and, and here how the machine will look like. Is the LHC is underground. The depth is about 100 meters. There we're thinking about more 600 meters because we have to go through a very large region. Why I'm mentioning this? Because this machine is not really for me, it's for you. Uh, the leading time for a, for a machine to be built uh, started from the first thought of this machine is, is about 20 years. LAP is the collider that was built before uh, the LHC, run before the LHC. And the LHC actually, with my predecessor, they start to think about the LHC already in the, in the 80s. And that's what we are thinking about the future circular collider of FCC. Uh, Say, so you see, from first idea to construction is about 20 years. So that's where we are now. We started to think uh, how to build it with the idea to have it around 2035, 2040. So you're gonna see it. I'm gonna be retired most probably by then, but we have to think how to build it, okay? Because it's a problem of generations now. Now, the last thing before I leaving you, as I said, someone thought even bigger. So Enrico Fermi at a certain point thought uh, in the last years of his life, why we don't put an accelerator all around the, the Earth? So then the radius is not anymore a real uh, limitation, and the energy can be large, can be 5,000 TV. Now, I'm not going to go into the, the details of all of this, but his proposal was to build it in 1994. Now, probably we didn't solve so far all the technological details, actually, to have this built. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simone, <laughs> for this very impressive presentation. Are there questions? You can raise your hand in Zoom or you can type a question in the Q&A. you want to to voice your question we'll we'll also answer to questions in in english french german and italian my german is very poor you remember i'll <laughs> i'll i'll translate for you <laughs> the answer will come in english so that everybody can profit from it but uh, you can ask in any of those languages Okay, so there is there is one question uh, from Nathaniel. If we had one around the Earth, how big would it be? So that's your last slide, I think. So uh, the radius is going to be eight thousand kilometers. Okay, so the idea is that the, the one would would put it really in, in orbit, uh, a little bit like the space station. Instead, it's going to be it could be really the. Um, the entire circumference, uh, of, not of the Earth, because it's going to be more than that, because it's beyond the atmosphere. So Fermi was thinking about a 8,000 kilometers uh, radius, something like this. Now, actually, I, I must say, the, the, when I was a PhD student at CERN with one of my friends, we, we, we started, you see it's written 8,000 kilometers. Uh, we started to think uh, how to do that. Uh, complicated. It's not for my generation, most probably it's more. I, I leave it a problem. Thank you. There's another question. How much did the project LHC cost so far? Oh. 
I, I, I don't have the, the exact number, but I would say between four and five billions, or something like this, if I remember correctly. There was, the tunnel was there. There was at the at the startup of the LHC, we we put together the cost of the LHC and all experiments, mm -hmm. and that was uh, six point nine billion. So about four to five billion for the LHC is the the right ballpark. And uh, CERN always uh, budgets in Swiss francs. Mm. Exactly. Oh, another question. Are there any risks for the people living around the LHC while it is turned on? No, absolutely not. The LHC, first of all, is, is underground. So the industrial risks related to high current, low temperature, uh, they are completely isolated from all the rest. And if we're talking about radiation, the radiation of the machine is by far not comparable to the radiation you probably heard being discussed for nuclear power plants or things like this, so no. Wow, now the questions come in. So uh, let's uh, first stay with the, uh, with the dangerousness. So um, what about the uh, bad news about creating small theoretical black holes? Okay. And, and uh, another question, what if the LHC explodes? So the, the, uh, I, I would cite uh, as an example of one of my former colleagues, uh, Alvaro de Rufola, who is a colleague, but you know, uh, it's a very high level colleague, okay? I, I cannot compare it to, to him. He's one of the big theoreticians that actually re replied uh, to, uh, um, to a news uh, to the same question is that the, the, he computed the probability, and the probability basically it would be the same as a, uh, an hippopotamus, I think, would be lifted uh, from the Sahara Desert and would fall on our heads now. Um, so the, the, uh, it's, 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 it's not conceivable. It's computable, okay? But it's not conceivable. Th then what was the other, the other question? Ooh. Uh, I'm not so sure what you mean by explosions. Uh, what, I, what I know, that we had an accident in the LHC in the sense that what, what happened a few years ago is that the uh, um, liquid helium at 2 Kelvin, if it goes to, uh, to room temperature, goes through a certain number of phase transition like water that is ice, it becomes liquid and then it becomes gas. And this releases a certain amount of energy and uh, due to a, a failure to ground, so 11,000 ampere, uh, basically one of the conductors between two junctions of two magnets broke, and then the, uh, and then the, the energy released, uh, this one eighth of uh, the 10 gigajoules were released uh, in a magnet. This broke the, uh, the, the pipe where helium was flowing, and this created a, this release of uh, energy between uh, uh, different, uh, uh, when, when you know, went to, through different phase transition. And this damaged the machine. This damaged a few kilometers of the machine. Now, first of all, it's underground. Second, there's no one in the tunnel in this case. Uh, and it's not really an explosion. So I don't know if this replies uh, uh, to the question. OK. Um... Well, a, a follow-up here is, do you feel the LHC when you're up here? No. I feel it because I'm nervous, <laughs> because, I'm, because I'm responsible of a, of a part of the equipment. And uh, I'm feeling it because I'm excited, because every day we could discover something. But the, the machine itself, uh, we don't feel it. Okay, so then there is um, another question, which is how much energy does the LHC cost to run? Okay, uh, so the, 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 in terms of, uh, it's, it's, it's like a small town. It's, now I don't remember if it is between 80 megawatts or 100 megawatts or something like this. And this but, but that's the kind of uh, numbers we, we, we are speaking about to maintain the, the LHC code. Now, the, the exact number, what I can do, I can add it to the, to the slide in such a way that well, it's, it's well-defined. 
Okay. Um, there is one question which you actually answered, I think, in the talk. If there is a problem with cooling, do you have to heat up the whole circumference of the LHC or is there a possibility to separate the parts no, the, you have to repair? The LHC, in fact, I, I, I can put the slide eventually in this way, is, is, is clear. Oops. So the LHC is separated into sectors. And, and this is sector one, two, two, three. The number is from one interaction point to another interaction point. And in fact, the LHC is, is eight independent accelerators which are interlocked, say, which are connected. Okay? So we can, we can separate uh, the intervention in one part of the machine from the other. Evidently, if one part of the machine is at room temperature, we cannot run the machine. Uh, but that's why what you see on, on these slides uh, is, is, is that all the sectors, they have to be roughly between 1.9 and 2 and 2 Kelvin. But no, we don't have to eat up, luckily enough, uh, all, the, uh, all the sectors together if we have to uh, work on one sector. Also because uh, we don't have necessarily have on site uh, the space to store all the, the helium, all the helium that which is needed to cool the machine. So actually, uh, we, we, we prefer to keep the helium in the machine. Uh, to avoid playing around with, with where to put helium uh, in different places. Okay, thank you. Just as the question comes quite a lot, um, the talk will be recorded and it will be visible on the Indico page, including the questions and answers now. Okay. Now, there is a question, uh, does the LHC make noise? And yes, how loud? <laughs> Uh, the collision that don't make any noise. We do have noise. Uh, for example, when we extract the beam from the LHC, so at the very end, what I was saying before, uh, let me see if I can find the, the right image. In a good day of the LHC, when, when we extract the beam and we send it uh, to the external beam line, because we don't want to use any more uh, the beam. Oh, no. uh, where it is. Okay, anyhow, uh, the impact on the beam on the surface does make noise because of the thermal expansion uh, and the thermal mechanical stresses which are induced on this, on this surface. So that's where we can hear the beam, okay? And in fact, it, it looks like a, a ping or something similar. We don't hear the beam when it's circulating the machine. We don't hear the beam when it's colliding at the, at the interaction point. Okay, um, we're back to dangerous. Are there any dangerous particles in the LHC? No, no, absolutely not. Okay, um, then we have a physics question. How much of the universe is made out of dark matter and how will we try to understand it? Well, the, 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 the largest fraction by far it's 95, 96% that depends on how you define dark energy or dark matter. First of all, while it's called matter, uh, sorry, dark, because we don't see it. In the sense, it doesn't interact with light. It doesn't generate light. Um, the idea is that we are trying to understand if there are particles which are not in the standard model. Um, this eventually I can, uh, I can show you a spare slide. So ordinary matter is, is, is done by this, okay? Uh, and even antimatter, we know that it's done by this, okay? Uh, which is basically by quarks. So we, we have two family. Those are the hadrons, so those are neutrons, uh, protons, the things you know. Uh, pions, which are particles made by two quarks. Uh, so this, we know is there, we know how it behaves. And, and those are leptons, which are the electrons that you all know about, and the cousins, which are a little bit heavier than the electrons, uh, which are not stable particles, which are muons and tau. And this is uh, for, uh, th those are for particles, and then you have uh, uh, the neutrinos that goes with that. And then if you have electrons, you have anti-electrons, anti-muons, anti-tau, and up, anti-up, uh, anti-charm, so on, which constitute anti-matter. Unfortunately, this paradigm 
uh, this nice table works only for the 4%, 5% of the matter that we know. So the idea is that when we smash particles in the LHC, we expect that something is missing what we were expecting. So we do detect all of these because those are the particles we are able to, to see. In fact, quarks are not directly by their product. And then we are trying to see if there is something missing there, uh, which we cannot explain. And that's the way we're trying to find uh, uh, new particles, dark matter, uh, or, or dark energy. We try to see what should be there for other reasons, but we don't see. Thank you. Then uh, there are two more questions here. So one of them is, how hot can the LHC get? Uh, in, in which terms? In terms of the machine, the machine cannot run if it's not a 2 Kelvin. Uh, it, say, 2 Kelvin plus or minus uh, 0.5, 0 0.5 Kelvin, something like this. Uh, so the, the windows, the window uh, on which the machine can work is, is not, it's not big, in fact. Um, it depends on the, the energy at which the machine works in the sense that if we run the machine at 6.8 TV per beam, uh, we can in increase the, uh, uh, the temperature a little bit less than if you would be running a 3 TV the machine because uh, superconductivity is, is, so th those famous cables are occurring at 11,000 ampere for 7 TV, they are behaving a little bit differently when you put different currents. Um, so the, you can, uh, you can, you can increase a little bit the temperature, but not beyond 3, D, 3 Kelvin, for example. Okay? Then, then it's not going to work. Okay, and then there was a question, uh, is there any radioactive waste in the LHC? Yes, it does, there is. Uh, uh, it's, it's not, again, don't, don't think that the LHC in terms of a nuclear power plant, okay? Uh, it's, it's, it's not as radioactive as the fuel of, the nuclear, of a nuclear power plant, but it's classified as a nuclear waste. That's why we treat it as nuclear waste. So we, we are working with external authority, the, the, our French and Swiss authorities, in such a way that first we always try to minimize the, the nuclear waste that, the, that we produce, or to have nuclear waste which, which can be stored easier uh, at the end of the life of the LHC or the end of the specific hardware that becomes radioactive. The other point is that the, uh, we minimize the waste by using uh, some part of the hardware in other accelerators, for example, uh, because in any case, it's going to become even more activated. But until we use it, it's fine, because that's, that's the way some of those parts, they have to be used, because they have to intercept the beam, they have to see the protons, so they do become radioactive. But okay, we're not talking about anything which is even closer to a nuclear power plant. Okay, and uh, I think a final question. Now, how long does, it, does the LHC take data or the experiments take data? How long do they run? And uh, is there any limit to that? Is the LHC stopped when they are okay. finished? So the, the, uh, uh, I think that the, the, uh, the question is per day, per year, and per block of years, okay? So the, the LHC typically per day, uh, the maximum we run the LHC uh, without extracting the beam and putting back the beam is between 35 and 40 hours continuously. Um, then the intensity of the beam becomes too small uh, for the protection system of the LHC to see it because the energy stored in the, in the LHC of the beam, um, it's, it's in any case a few megajoules. Oh, it's 400, 500 megajoules. So if, if the beam touches the, uh, uh, the aperture where the, the beam is flowing, it's going to damage it. Okay? So there is, a, uh, there is a system that tells us uh, every uh, roughly 75 meters where the beam is. You remember, we have to throw the beam without any mistake through the span of the one euro coin, 11,000 per second without, uh, without any mistake. Uh, so below a certain intensity, this system doesn't see the beam anymore. So the, 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 the LHC cannot protect himself uh, so well as in other cases. So typically 40 hours is something. So every 40 hours, in any case, we, we, we took away the beam and we restart. 
Then during one year, we have uh, about 200 days of physics, roughly, okay? So uh, between starting the LHC, stopping it, uh, and so on and so forth. So the experiment detects data over 200 days. Where is the limit? But the limit first, we have to do maintenance because there are parts which are consumed by the use every year. So typically, we stop sometimes in December and we restart some, sometimes in March, uh, April. Uh, in such a way that during winter time, uh, we, we do our repairing, but also the other accelerators, but also in the experiments. So over one year, we have roughly 200 days of, of operation. And then we work in this cycle of three, four years of continuous data taking uh, in such a way that every, say, those four, five, three, four, five years, then we have a block of two years where we do all the improvements that will require stopping the machine, put it in at room temperature, pulling apart the experiments, and changing uh, the various things. Uh, so we just finished long shutdown two, and then we're, we're planning now long shutdown three in 2026, 2027. So that's the lifetime. Uh, one, of the, one of the major technological challenges which are not in the accelerators, which are in the experiments, is where to store the data at a certain point. Also. So there, there is one, one of the big, uh, say, advancement that we need to run the LHC is the computing power. Okay? It's not something I didn't mention here, but clearly every 25 nanoseconds, you, you have to imagine we have something like uh, 100 collisions, data from the experiments, they have to be stored somewhere. So we have terabytes and terabytes, which means uh, hard drives of hard drives every day coming out from the collisions where there could be new physics that you have to put somewhere, analyze, and try to understand where, where new things are. So that's one of the technological challenges of the, also of the LHC. I don't know if this exhausts a little bit the Say, and the life of the LHC is, uh, we think that we're gonna run on, until 2040 or something like this. Thank you very much. I think we have answered all questions. And uh, well, thank you for the uh, nice Perfect. presentation and for the answering the, of the questions. And uh, thanks to all the attendees for, for staying with us. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this, this webinar and you'll find the recording, as I said, uh, on the Indico page of the event um, in a day or two, depending on when the video is being processed. Thanks a lot. Have a good day and uh, see you soon at another webinar.